So welcome to the Adventures in Learning podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Diane, and today I'm fangirling a little bit because we have one of my favorite illustrators on, Karina Lukin. She is the author illustrator of ABC and You and Me, which is coming out this week. But I grew to fall in love with her work um, through Patchwork, which she co-authored with Matt De La Pena, and that was a New York Times and Kirkus Best Picture book. Um, I also have fallen in love with The Tree in Me, My Heart, and The Book of Mistakes, and I'm so excited to welcome her to the studio. So welcome, Karina. Thank you for having me, Diane. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am so excited to have you. And before we begin and talk about ABC and You and Me, I want our listeners to know a little bit more about you. So can you describe your adventures in learning and how you wound up doing what you do today? <laughs> well, my journey was a uh, slow and circuitous route. So I, I didn't know... I kind of found my way slowly to where I am today making books. And I think, you know, when I was when I was a little elementary school age, I wanted to be a gymnast or a veterinarian. My mom was a scientist, a biologist. So I was around a lot of science people and um, and I liked to be outside. So I thought maybe I'd do something with that. I liked animals, but I always loved to read. I always loved poetry and I always loved to draw. And it was really sort of after college, um, I had worked in a bookstore and I came across a book that um, that I loved. My manager of the bookstore I used to work at handed me this book, The Very Persistent Gappers of Fripp, which was written by George Saunders, illustrated by Lane Smith. And I really think like that is the book that I say gave me like the chills up and down my body and made me go, whoa, you can do this. I didn't I didn't know you could do this kind of storytelling where the words and pictures come together and um and create this magical thing and I had I had grown up reading a lot my mom would take me to the library my grandparents would take me to the library but um uh, from when I realized it was what I wanted to do to when I actually started making books it was another 15 or so years so it's been a slow journey so what happened in those 15 or so years to take you to making books well, so for starters, I didn't I didn't go to art school um, and I wasn't sure, you know, when I was going into college that that was what I wanted to do. I really wanted to study lots of different things. And so um, not going to art school, you know, that probably can slow down the process for an Ill, as an illustrator. Um, but I did take a lot of I had some wonderful writing teachers and I took a lot of write, writing classes in college. And then I also stumbled into these dance classes um, my first year of college, these dance improvisation classes. And I had never been a dancer. Um, I had done gymnastics. I'd done Aikido, but I'd never done dance. And I didn't think of myself as um, coordinated in that way or, you know, being able to stay in rhythm and follow choreography and all that. And these dance improvisation classes just blew my mind. They were um, because they're performance improvisation. So it was about learning how to be creative in the moment, um, spur of the moment. And it very much like reminded me of um, the practice of mindfulness, which I had also gotten interested in through um, when I worked in the bookstore, I had discovered some books by Thich Nhat Hanh, who's this Vietnamese Buddhist monk and peace activist. And so he, he does a lot of um, writing and work around being mindful of your present moment, whether you're eating an orange or washing dishes. And so this dance improvisation came into my life in college and it was all about being mindful while being creative. And that like, blew my mind open, even though I wasn't at all interested in being a dancer. Like that wasn't, right. but I ended up learning more through that program, that dance department, than I learned through any of, I mean, in many ways, I think I owe more to the dance department at Middlebury College and a couple of these instructors I had that were just incredible. Um, they taught me more about kind of the creative process and, and directly linked to how I approach creativity than I learned in any art class that I took. Um, even though I took a, I took just enough art classes in college to get into printmaking and I had these great writing teachers, but this sort of idea that you could take improvisation, which we usually think of as, you know, jazz music or maybe theater improvisation, comedy. Um, I didn't realize you could do it with dance. And I started thinking about how that was actually something I was already doing when I drew. Um, so even though my journey was like super winding and super sort of, you know, I looked back, I actually graduated with a um, a degree through the dance department because they were the only department that would let me do this multidisciplinary thing with um, poems and a book of prints. And I wanted, I basically wanted to make a picture book. I wanted to put words and pictures together. And um, 
I did it through the dance department. And then afterwards, I always was thinking, why did I do that? Like, why was I a dance major? Like, what, it doesn't make any sense, you know? And then now, a good 20 years later, all of a sudden, it makes so much sense to me because it's like, that's where I learned to be creative um, in a way that is directly responsible for the book of mistakes and for the ABC and you and me that's coming out right now. Um, and even something like tree and me and my approach to some of that. So, um, but I basically graduated college, you know, started making greeting cards, waitressed a lot, worked as a teaching assistant, worked in a health food store, um, did a lot of odd and, and worked for nonprofit arts organization, did more teaching, all of that kind of trying to keep my work somewhat part-time so that I could work on books right. and submit. You know. So that, that process took a long time. Um, and eventually I became a mother and that slowed my process down quite a bit, but it also enriched my process so much. So really, I think like my, my great idea is my first book, sort of finding an agent and finding an editor and art director that were interested that all came through ideas I had once I became a parent. So that all makes so, yeah. total sense. Yeah, it's a lot. It, it was it was so it was long and slow, but you know, for um, it's not that way for everyone. And looking back on it, I was certainly impatient for a lot of that time. But looking back on it now, I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't, you know, taken that particular journey. Sure. So, and I'm, there are I'm, no I'm, wasted experiences. I mean, all of those experiences ultimately lead to where we are supposed to be on our journey. Yeah. And it sounds like as you're talking um, that so much of this is informed ABC and you and me, which is coming out this week. Um, and I was wondering yeah. if you could talk a little bit about this book, um, what it is, what it means to you and um, why it's special. So this book is um, actually one of the first, it's so special and near and dear to my heart. And I will, like, I have my little floppy proof thing that I will hold up for um, you to see here. But it's it's ABC and you and me, and the cover has um, three big letters, the A, the B, and the C that are people making the shapes of the letters. And so the whole book is um, grownups making the shapes of the big letters, kids making the shapes of the little letters, and, um, you know, and them moving together. So we have, you know, each page also has, um, you know, like an iguana for I and a um, headband for H and things hidden in there. But interspersed between the letter pages, there are these um, dancing pages with dancing bodies, moving bodies. So the whole book begins, can you wiggle your wrists? That's the first line on the first page is, you know, can you wiggle your wrists? And then there's a series of questions like, can you um, twist from your hips? Can you lean without bending your knees? Um, and so, you know, if so, then follow me. And then there's an invitation to move into the book. And so the book has people making letter shapes, but it also has bodies moving and dancing. And it's directly like, um, the dancing pages directly and, and the ABC letters too all come from that dance experience. But this was an idea I had really not that long after college. Um, and I first submitted this book more than 15 years ago and got rejection letters. So it's, it's been, um, the process has been long and slow. And so it's very near and dear to my heart, but it's also very much like my entire learning and growth process as an artist and illustrator basically is in this book. So my very first drafts that I sent off that I got, you know, some nice rejection letters from that I saved from from editors. Um, there was a there was just this process of sort of getting rejection letters, trying again, sending out again, getting more rejection letters, being told things like, you know, an alphabet book is a very it's a saturated market. There's a lot of alphabet books out there. So I was hearing a lot of like, you know, this is um an alphabet book has to be super, super special to make it in the market, or maybe you should try, you know, a different approach to trying to get into the industry, or this would make a nice poster, but maybe not a great book. And um, at a certain point in the process, I started to think, well, maybe there, maybe it's not a good first book, but maybe it still could be a book someday. So I just sort of set it aside and focused on other things, um, thinking I never could quite let go of it, but thinking maybe I'll just revisit it someday. And um, and then I did revisit a few times and, and every time I would hear things like, you know, this is a neat idea, but make a nice poster. And um, when I started, uh, you know, right before I got into the industry, I was attending conferences and I won a few portfolio awards and 
I was getting that kind of feedback because a few of the pieces were in my portfolio, a few of the letter people. And, um, and so I, again, put it aside and started making other books, wrote the book of mistakes, started my, my career. That was my first book. And then, you know, about seven books in, I started thinking about this ABC book again and really feeling like, well, maybe now it's time. You know, I, I, I just, ideas come back around to you and it came back to me and I, and I couldn't let go of it. I couldn't shake it. And I really had this strong feeling like it, now is the time for this book. Um, and it was in the midst of the early stages of the pandemic. And I was definitely like, kids are on screen so much. And I, I was feeling like maybe just as a, as a um, larger culture of people, we were sort of really becoming aware of how, how important it is for kids to move. And that instead of this pe being seen as just, you know, just bodies in motion, that that could be, that could be what's important and what to, is to be celebrated about it. Let, that this is an opportunity to look at the alphabet, but to get up and move and to have um, grownups and kids moving together, you know? And so I went back with, you know, the experience of seven books and all of that learning and growth of like page turn and how to tell a story and how to make it interesting. I went back to those alphabet people and I went, oh no, they're right. Like, it's not, it's not a book. It's a poster, but it's not a book. It's a little bit repetitive. It's not that exciting all the way through. And so that was when I started, um, just, I was thinking about it a lot and I started, you know, imagining these words, this language about movement. And I started to realize that I could thread the two together and I could weave movement pages with letter pages. And then it becomes something a little more interesting to, to re as a reading experience, you know? Um, so yeah, so that's the, that, that book has had a longer journey than any other book I've made and it's finally coming out into the world. And, um, and I'm just super, super excited about it. Well, I'm excited for it too. Um, I used to run a preschool in New York. And um, one of the things I'm realizing is I'm working with early childhood teachers in particular is kids need that opportunity to move and to grow. And I love the fact that you've got opportunities and invitations for them to wiggle and to move and to be able to um, imitate the letters, to use their whole bodies in that. I think that that then unleashes creativity and gives you opportunities to try other things. And I particularly appreciate that the illustrations are reflecting children um, from across cultures and across um, experiences. And I think that that's something that's super powerful as well is all children deserve to be able to see themselves reflected in the books that we're reading in early childhood. Yeah. Yeah. It was super important to me that there be um, a wide range of ages and abilities and body sizes and types and all of that in the book. And that, I mean, that's what makes it fun to draw, right? Is like, that's, that's the most fun part is drawing the people. Um, for me, I love drawing people so much. Um, but I also, so I just did like a sneak peek of this book with an elementary school here in my hometown. And I shared it with a group of K through um, second graders and um, I started reading it. And as soon as the first line, can you wiggle your wrists? I look out and everyone's just, you know, like they're so ready. They're so primed. They're already wiggling their wrists. And I was thinking um, I'd read through the book once and then go through again and kind of do some movement stuff with them. Sure. Um, so it was clear that they were ready. Like they were just ready to move, you know? Um, and so we did, I actually, so another thing I'm working on right now that I'm, I'm excited about is, um, you know, on my website for all of my books, I have resources for teachers. So I have like a, a social emotional learning guide for some of my books and um, there's art activities and writing activities. But for this one, I'm working on a movement script. So I'm actually um, have written out sort of a oh, that's the script wonderful. Or guide that, that I used. And so it goes through the book. And so it's, um, you know, for some teachers, they might actually print it out and want to read through it directly. Other people might just glance at it and get the idea and, and improvise on their own, you know, but it, it has things like on the page where there's an elbow or a wrist mentioned, then there would be some movement that is with the elbows and the wrists or, so it might be, you know, draw a letter with your elbow and that you, oh, that's that you write fun. with and then draw the same letter with your other elbow or, um, so I, I do see, um, I don't know, in a way I'm more excited about sharing this book than I've been in a while, because I think, the the K to two at this school, it was so fun to share it with them. It was such a fun experience all the way through. Um, 
And that is a, you know, it's fun to be able to share a book, but it's also fun to get a room full of people moving. Oh, absolutely. And we should have that kind of movement and that kind of creative liberation in all grades. And so I love the fact that this book is going to unlock that for teachers and that you've provided that in the resources. So that sounds wonderful. Do you have a favorite page turn you want to share with folks? Um, oh, that's such a good one. Well, maybe what I'll just share. Um, I mean, I have, you know, I have so many favorite little, little moments and the, the colors of the book, like the LMN. Um, but I think, and, and a lot of the dancing pages are our favorites, like this one, um, from the tip of your toes to your elbows and nose, your ankle, your chin, and your knees. So you can see here, there's all kinds of stuff opportunities for moving absolutely that um but then the whole book ends with this idea um and so this is what I think would be this would also be fun to share is just this idea of from the biggest a all the way down to the littlest z what shapes can you be I love and so that. that's, you know, that's the end. And it is, it really is an invitation. So hopefully, whether it's a parent, a librarian, a teacher, um, whoever's reading it, a kid by themselves, that there is just kind of this, when, when I have shared it, um, the kids immediately, they just want to make shapes. And when I've had it on the wall in my studio and my daughter, who's 13, when her friends have come by and they walk by, they like, they can't resist trying to make a couple shapes. And I'm like, okay, if a 13 year old wants to do this and, um, Actually, in Virginia, at the Virginia Children's Book Festival, we had a couple letters projected on the wall during this. Um, I had an exhibit of art at the Longview Center for the Arts. And so part of it, we projected just the um, VCBF for Virginia Children's Book Festival. And we put a rug down, or they did, the, the gallery people. They did such a nice job. They put a rug down and some cozy pillows. And um, the space was open to all these school groups. And, and once again, like the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, even they would get down on the carpet and try to make the V, you know, try to make the C. And um, it is, it's fun to see that it is sort of, um, it doesn't need much explanation. You know, it's like, yeah, some of the ones are really hard, and, but a lot of them, there's plenty that are not so hard to make. Well, and as you're talking, I'm thinking back to another part of my former life. Before I started doing this, I was director of education at a children's museum, and I could 100% see a partnership between your book and that notion of projections in children's museums across the country, because that would be such a great interactive exhibit activity that you could be doing to see those letters projected and can you create the shapes and what else can you create? Yeah. Yeah. With your, with your body moving. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that would be so fun. That would be so cool to, yeah. To do some kind of partnership like that. I love that idea actually. Um, so if there are any uh, museum directors out there, you, <laughs> need to, you need to talk to Karina. Yes. So I want to go back and talk a little bit about some of your other books as well. Um, before we got on, we were talking a little bit about Patchwork, which you wrote with uh, Matt De La Pena. And I was telling you, I use, I love using this book when I'm out on the road with teachers. I do a lot helping teachers to connect STEM and STEAM learning with multicultural picture books. Mm -hmm. And so I've been using Patchwork with teachers to get them to think about their past selves, their present self and their future self, who they wanna be. And so often I'll read the book, I'll have them make a patch and we'll put together a quilt of all the educators in the room. And wow. it's been such a powerful way to get them thinking like the kids, to get them open to the notion of how can we build connections. So mm -hmm. I wanna spend a little time just talking about this beautiful book, what inspired it? What was the collaboration process like? Um, what what prompted your artwork for this? Yeah, wow. Well, I love I love hearing that you share it with teachers in that way. And I love um, this idea of this room full of teachers thinking about themselves as a kid and and then who they are now and who they will become. And and um, I just love that. So thank you for for using the book in that way. Um, I know for Matt, it's um, you know, it's a book that means a great deal to him. Um, and I think, he, he sees himself, like there's certain sections of the book where it's clearly Matt, like the basketball player who becomes yes. a poet. Um, but I think there's other, there's a lot of other sections. I was asking him about it um, 
that I think in some ways there's a little bit of him in every single one. And, you know, he says the, da the dancer one very much the rhythm of the one, two, three and the rhythm of, of um, language and poetry that's all in there and, and athleticism. Um, I actually think Matt is, he's a very, very kind person. I think he also would give away his cookie. <laughs> yes. I think that's him too, you know? So, um, and that, that actually is something I could relate to as well as a, as a kid is that, you know, just being, um, being sensitive to other people's suffering and wanting, wanting other people to feel, um, to feel good and to feel connected. And so, um, so that, that book, there was a lot about it that I basically was given the manuscript and asked if I wanted to illustrate it. And, um, yeah, as an illustrator, it's always not just, do I like it, but can I, can I imagine being in this world? Is there anything I can bring to it that I think would, um, you know, make me the right person for this project? And so, with this book, I um, it was it's very like the words themselves are are quite abstract in a certain way. And Matt is um, wh what I think of as wonderful um, author to work. Well, he is a wonderful author to work with, and one of the reasons why is that he doesn't do a lot of like illustration notes or telling you what to do. He's very hands off, and he gives the illustrator a lot of room, which is um, you know which is what you want. And I'm really fortunate in that all the writers that I've worked with have been that way and given me space to sort of come at it from, um, without any preconceived ideas. You know, it, I like to say like the writer has a blank page and the illustrator, you want to start with a blank page too, as, as much as possible. And, um, and so what I immediately was drawn to when I got that, so I, you know, I get a manuscript and I start kind of like, I read through it once for sound. And for me, it, if something doesn't have a good rhythm and a good sound, like I'm, it's hard for me to get into it. It has to sound good read aloud because it's, that's what a picture book is. It's, it's an art form that's meant to be shared. It's meant to be read aloud. And I have always loved poetry and I, I um, am an appreciator of the sound of language. And so he has, um, he has a lovely sound to his work, which I was drawn to. And then also it seemed like I could play and have fun because it was a little abstract, like it seemed like there was room in there to, to play around and do something interesting. And then I loved where it was going. So part of the reason I also wanted to illustrate it is I just wanted to illustrate the end of the book. Like I, I wanted to do this layering. I wanted to take all these people and build towards this idea. And the book ends with this, this line, we are beautiful. And, um, and I really wanted to draw that last we are beautiful spread with lots and lots and lots of people. Like I had a strong vision of that right away. And so um, that's sort of one question is, do I like where this is going or do I, would I be excited to be on the journey of where this is heading? And for me, the answer was very much yes. And, um, and then, you know, I, I actually talked with Matt more than I usually do with um, writers on a book, just because I already knew him a little bit. And so, and I knew we have the same agent and our, agent told me that Matt was very hands off. And so I shouldn't be worried about, because that's one of the reasons why authors and illustrators don't usually talk is to protect the, the illustrator's creative process. Right. Sure. Um, and so if you know someone and you've done multiple books with them, it, that changes everything because suddenly they're a friend. And then of course you're going to talk at least a little bit to them. And, um, but Matt, so Matt and I already knew each other and I knew he wouldn't, he wouldn't interfere in a, in an unpleasant way. And so we actually had a couple wonderful conversations during the process of making the book, which is a little unusual about, um, you know, moments where I wasn't, I wanted to make sure I understood his intention carefully and, and accurately. And so there was a little bit of that talking, which is unusual for me in the process, but mostly I just, you know, I go in and I just, I set aside ideally ideally a big chunk of time. A month would be great. I don't always have a month, but a big chunk of time to play. And this is really my process for every book where I don't have to worry about if I like the images at all. I don't have to worry about if I like the work. And I'm really just trying to experiment with different art materials, experiment with different approaches to the book and, um, you know, sort of improvise in order sure. to figure out the language that I'm going to use. And so that's how I start every single process. So Patchwork had that and the the pieces that I was building were all these kind of assembled patches. And um, in the end, actually my studio wall ended up with all of these like overlapping. I ended up, it's a different book behind me now that I'm working on, but at the time I had all these overlapping layers of color and I would make something new and just stick it on top of something else, you know? And, oh, fun. Um, 
to sort of get my head in that space of of a patchwork and of covering some things up and letting some things show through. And um, so, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a really fun project to work on. And um, Matt was a wonderful collaborator. Um, so it's fun. It's fun to see it out in the world. And I, I love hearing what um, teachers are doing with it, you know, it's just a yeah, and it's just such a beautiful book. Um, you referenced Teek Nhat Han a, a few minutes ago when we were mm -hmm. talking, and um, that resonated with me because um, the writings also had resonated with me, and that whole mindful approach to walking and eating and being with others to being in the moment that seems to ground a lot of your work in terms of the stories that you've written and that you've illustrated. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that influence? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would say that's hugely important in, in the work I make and my approach to bookmaking. And um, I was in high school when I first came across a book by Thich Nhat Hanh and it was called Pieces Every Step. And it's this little skinny book that has a dandelion on the cover. I love that book. And I love that book so much, so much. Um, so that book just stole my, it just stole my heart. You know, I just um, was really into it. It just spoke to something in me at that moment in time. And um, I remember I started drawing dandelions on everything, like, like the side notes of my paper is in school. And I, um, I had some acrylic paints I painted. I had this pair of like ripped jeans. I painted a dandelion on my <laughs> jeans. You know, I was so in into this idea of this thing that we we can like think of as a weed or we can overlook and and that that seeing that and really seeing it, looking at it fully aware, like with mindfulness and and slowing down, you could just see how beautiful it is. And Thich Nhat Hanh has this line in a poem I have, he says, um, I have lost my smile, but do not worry, the dandelion has it. And so just this idea that that the world around you could be a keeper of joy for you, and that even if you've lost it, and you know, he experienced so much suffering in his life with the Vietnam War and lost so many friends and people close to him. And um, and yet he was he's he was out there practicing living in the present moment and finding peace and beauty in it. And I found it, you know, those turbulent adolescent years, like I found it so inspiring and I continued. So I read, you know, his miracle of mindfulness. And then I started reading many of his other books. Um, and um, eventually that was kind of throughout college. And then eventually, you know, in college, I was becoming interested in writing and I was looking for jobs to have in the summer and, um, and I became kind of aware, I started looking at the books that he had because I had worked in a bookstore and I knew a little bit about books and I realized, oh, they're all published by the same publisher and it's down in the San Francisco Bay Area and I had some family there. So I was um, it was able to set up a, in a summer internship with Parallax Press that makes his books and work on their, like their magazine uh, monthly zine thing that they did. And um and then in exchange for that, I I was um, allowed to go to one of his retreats. Oh, wow. Um, so that was a very powerful experience. I got to spend, you know, a week with him and a bunch of other people on a, on a university campus going for walks and listening to him talk. And um, so, yeah, so he, he was a huge influence and I, and I was fortunate to meet him one other time. Um, so he's a very big influence in sort of my life and how I, think about what it means to live a good life. Um, you know, what, what things you can do to try to, you know, the things you can control and the things you can't control in the right. life. And um, he's definitely at a very young age gave me this gift of perspective. And so when I think about the books I make and the kinds of books I like to make, I do feel um, there is a big part of me that feels like I was given this gift of perspective at a, at a young enough age that it sort of shaped who I am in the world and how I see the world. And I would just love it if in um, some small way, the books that I make can do the same thing without being um, 
without being overly dogmatic or tied to any specific tradition necessarily, but just sort of an invitation to, you know, to be aware and to look at the world. And I think um, for me, mindfulness, what it is, is is a perspective shift. It's a different way of looking, right? And so right. that I'm so interested in that, like that combination of sort of really being present and aware in the in the moment, but also looking at the world in a slightly different way. And, and that idea of like, if you can change your perspective, it can change everything about how you see the world. I, I do feel like that's something that in one way or another is in every single book that I've made. I was um, going to say, I absolutely see that it shines through in the book of mistakes for sure. Um, you know, you look at that initial mistake and then you change your perspective. What if it's yeah. not a mistake? What if it's a this? And yeah. it leads to that tree full of wonderful children at the end who I really just want to go play with them. Um, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you see yeah. that in your work that it's very much about, okay, we could look at it this way, but what if we looked at it this way? And I yeah. think that by giving kids that opportunity to look at the world and take a different perspective, you're giving them that social emotional um, strength to be able to build their learning. And that leads to those 21st century skills that we want them to have. Yeah. Yeah. That are so important. And I think, yeah, it's like perspective shift can also, it can be looking at yourself differently. Like I think about the end of the book of mistakes and this girl, this, this girl, and it's like, do you see now who she's becoming? And it's like, can you see that? It is a question. Like, do you see, who, and then do you see who she will be? Right. So it's like really a question about like, how do you see yourself and do you see your faults or do you see your potential? But also, how do you see other people in the world around you? How do you see the world? Like, a, and can you can you see potential and faults at the same time? Like, it, you know, can, can you, you hold them at the same enough? time? Yeah, yeah, and see both. And and sometimes that perspective shift can also be like a lot of the books I work on with other people. There's some element of kindness in there, or two different perspectives and a shift of like two kids who think they have nothing in common, like um, the book, nothing in common, or Adrian Simcox does not have a horse um, or patchwork or even something good. Like all these books I've done with other writers are really about um, kind of looking a little more closely at like our ideas of like, what does it mean to have something in common with someone, something in common with someone and want to be their friend, you know? And is it possible that there is as opposed to what we think of as common ground, like liking to do the same activities, you know, or um, what if there's a bigger common ground that has more to do with being someone in the world who's paying attention and someone in the world who notices other people and and like two kids who, who notice someone else, in this case, it's an old man who lost his dog and notices suffering and want to do something about it. That's actually such a tremendous common ground. That's more, that's bigger than liking to, you know, roller skate or sure. um, liking cats versus dogs or something like that. Like it's a, just a big, and to me, that is also about perspective, right? Like it's about reframing how, how you see. And I think, um, I don't know, it's so hard to separate out, you know, where you get different things in your life. But I would say that Thich Nhat Hanh gave me a lot of tools for, for like learning how to shift my perspective. And um, my mom certainly did as well. And my dad, but like, I remember one of his classic um, examples. And I, when I talk about like the tree in me, I like to, um, I, I wanted to talk about this idea of interconnection and interbeing. Yes. Without, um, I don't know. That was a book I wanted to make for a very long time. And every time I tried, it was just cliche. It was just like, it, it was, I was trying too hard or I was forcing it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, if, and so when I finally came around to it, I, I very much feel like that book owes, owes so much of its life to, to Thich Nhat Hanh. And um, I think of it like uh, when I talk about that book with students, I like to take an example of like a paintbrush that I would use to draw within my studio and be like, okay, so if you look at this, this paintbrush and take it home, we'll talk about an orange or an apple, but like, if you look at this paintbrush, you know, what is it made of? And it's made, it has a wooden handle, right? So it's like, you have the wooden handle. So this paintbrush is part tree. Um, and then you have the metal, a piece of metal holding the bristles and the metal is like mine from a mountain. So this paintbrush is actually part tree and part mountain. And then you have the bristles and, you know, maybe they're, animal bristles or maybe they're plastic like a lot of bristles now and so that plastic comes from a factory and so you have something like a paintbrush 
And actually it's part tree, part mountain and part factory. And then you look a little more deeply and actually the factory, like this wouldn't exist without the people in the factory who made the plastic, the people who assembled the paintbrush, those people wouldn't exist without uh, the farmers who grew their food. You know, those people would not exist without their parents and their grandparents that came before them. And all of a sudden you're looking at this little paintbrush um, without which there would be no book. I would not have made the tree in me without this brush, you know, and all of a sudden you're seeing the whole world in the paintbrush, in the paintbrush. and the whole world in this book. And, you know, that kind of, whatever that is, resetting your perspective thing. Um, I learned that from, from Thich Nhat Hanh and it, it changes everything, you know, it really does, you know, and you just talked about the tree in me. And one of the things I noted in that, um, I love nature and I, I attribute that to Teak as well, the walking and being out in nature. And I've gotten really interested in, um, my cellular, um, the, the network between trees. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I noted that you kind of go into that a little bit within the book as well. And yeah. I love the fact that you were able to bring that science into what you were doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Like the, um, actually that was probably my, that was one of my favorite pages to, to paint in that book is the, the, all the underground mushrooms. Um, it was just so fun to draw that this, um, forest with all the glowing uh, neon pink mushrooms and mycelia connecting them and connecting the trees. And um, yeah, so I mean, um, like I said earlier, my mom was actually a biologist. And so I grew up with this appreciation for for nature and the natural world. And um, actually, when I was really little, I just was bored out of my mind. We'd go on these native plant society walks and every two feet, they'd want to stop and look at a little flower, another little yellow flower. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I just couldn't like, it's a little too slow for a young child. Of pace. course. Um, but, you know, then I got older and I realized um, once I was living on my own, I realized how how much I needed, you know, houseplants in my house, which my mom had always had and all these things that I didn't think I I cared so much about. It turns out um, they, they went in, right? And that they went in at a very young age, which I think is, again, part of the magic of working with young children, right? Is what what that you can influence how they see the world in that way. But, um, but the, the mycorrhizal connections and the, the mushrooms, I remember hearing about that, reading about it a few years ago and just being blown away yes. by that web of connection, um, which is invisible to us. It's down below the ground, but it's keeping everything alive. And they even say, right, like now they realize that sometimes there'll be a, a dead quote unquote dead tree, you know, that has right. been cut down. And its roots are still part of that network that's sharing information with exactly. the living trees around it. Yeah, it's just fascinating stuff. So I love the yeah. fact that you went into that a little bit. I think it's very cool. So yeah, I know that that <laughs> behind you, you've got quite the bookshelf. And um, I was going to ask you a question, which is, are there books that you love that are out right now that um, inspire your process or that feed your soul as you're creating? Mm hmm. Um, well, yeah, as you can see, I love, I love books. <laughs> and I have so many um, that I love, it becomes really hard to um, hard to choose. And I, I start to forget, like, what, what have I seen most? I mean, the most recent one that is face out on my shelf is um, uh, illustrated by Cosby Cabrera. And I don't know the, the um, writer's name off the top of my head, but it's about Edna, the um, a famous chef from the South and it's yes. beautifully illustrated. Have you seen that one? Is that the one with the apple tree? Um, I'll grab it real quick. It's, um, it's called Chef Edna. Oh my it's goodness. Sad. That's a different version for Edna. Cause there's one about her apples. That's a different one. Oh um, yeah. Now this just came out like last week, maybe or something. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm um, excited for that one now. It's beautiful. And I love this illustrator so much, um, Cosby Cabrera. So she, you know, I definitely have my my lists of people where when they make a new book, I I buy it. There's a handful of illustrators that I love their work so much um, or authors. You know, there's writers like Julie Fogliano, who I, you know, will buy anything she makes of a sight on scene. Um, and illustrators like, um, well, there's so many. So you start to make a list and you just add more and more in your mind. but. Um, 
there's um, Isabel Arsenault and Julie Morstad and um, Christian Robinson, John Klassen. There's some of those, there's some contemporary people whose work I really love. Um, John Agee, he's a, he's one that I really, really admire. He's got his book of palindromes and they're smart. They're yes. smart and funny. Um, David Robertson, oh, you know, the list is just, it's so I'm, le I'm leaving off so many favorites, but there's, um, there's a, quite a long list of people who are making work that I really, um, Sean Harris that are making books that I just really appreciate. Um, Katya Chen is another illustrator that I love. Yeah. Well, and we're so fortunate to live in a time when there are so many beautiful books that we can bring into our classrooms, um, just more yeah. and more books. So hopefully yeah, we're finish. in a golden age for sure. There's no question that it's a, a rich time. Absolutely. So what are you excited about now? What do you have coming out? Um, I know ABC and you and me is coming out this month, but what's next? So after ABC and you and me in the fall, I have another book with Kate Hopfler, which is called In the Dark. And um, I can give you a peek at the cover. Actually, I have like a, this is um, a tale full, told from two perspectives. So um, there might be witches in the woods. There might not be witches in the woods. Oh, very cool. But the whole book opens vertically like this. Oh, wow. Um, and there is, this is a proof. So it's, the, the pages won't be shiny actually in the book, but um, there's two voices. There's two. So again, this perspective thing, but you have sort of this green voice saying one thing and then a purple voice saying something different and, um, and the stories come together. And so that is coming out in the fall. So this year I have two books coming out, but then what I'm actually working on right now, which will be for next year and what's behind me on the wall um, is the story that I have written and illustrated called The Arguers. And it is all about a group of people who are really, really good at arguing. And um, they're so good at arguing, they can argue with the stones and the flowers. And, um, and so, yeah, you can kind of see like someone's arguing with flowers here and a little stone here. And um, Sounds like so, a story for our times. It is. It's a story for our times. And it's a story that I, um, the ending has, has proven tricky. So there's an arguing contest and, um, and it doesn't go so well. And so the ending of the book, the visual ending of the book has been tricky. The words are pretty much in, in place. I've been sort of fussing with one here or there, but the, there's a big part of the ending piece that is going to be visual. And it's proven challenging um, because how do you create hope that feels um, genuine in 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 the midst of intractable conflict? Right. This right. is our this is our time, and um, and it's not. Um, I'm not interested in creating something overly positive, and I'm also not really wanting to leave my reader in a pit of despair. <laughs> So finding so, that balance between Pollyanna yeah. and the dark is the challenge. It's been a challenge and, and, and making it feel satisfying, like an ending that feels satisfying. And so I'm spending a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to feel satisfying? And I think um, I'm starting to suspect that the, the solution actually is in, is in humor um, and that, you know, you don't have to have everything sorted out, but if, if you can see the humor or the absurdity in a situation, um, you know, sometimes that's enough to at least satisfy at least one, one part of yourself, you know, so I don't know, but so this book has been, um, actually many years in the making and, um, has been swapped out with a couple of my other books just cause it needed more time. And so I'm finally focusing on it and, and it's, uh, you're speaking to me as I'm in the, very much in the midst of a puzzle and kind of trying to find my way out of it. Well, I can't wait to see what the outcome will be when it comes out next year. Um, Last question for you, are there, what brings you hope today? What brings me hope? Um, I think, I mean, many, many things actually. Um, not that I don't despair. There's plenty of things that make me feel that way as well. But um, I do feel hope when I watch my daughter and her friends and I see, um, I see ways in which she's growing up that are different from what, how I grew up. And some of them are more difficult, but others are kind of beautiful um, within their friendship groups and the way they treat each other and um, sort of 
the absence of shaming around people's bodies and how they look. And there's, you know, that, that fills me with hope. Um, I think uh, there's just so much beauty in the world. And, um, and I, I, yeah, when I guess, you know, I, I find hope in the beauty of the world, the natural world. And I find hope in, um, in children, you know, and in seeing, seeing them love the world, if that makes sense. Um, Makes total sense. Uh, Karina, thank you so much for joining us on the Adventures in Learning podcast. Um, We're so excited to see your book this week. I will share all of the contact information in the show notes so people can follow you, follow your website, and I wish you the best as you solve your puzzle. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, Diane. It was a pleasure to talk with you.